Concord Hospital Trust would like to recognize and thank the Walker Lecture Series for their generous sponsorship of What's Up Doc. The Walker Lecture Series offers a wide variety of programs on history, literature, art, and science, as well as dramatic, musical, and literary performances. All events are free to the public and held at the Concord City Auditorium. We encourage you to check out their website at walkerlecture.org to view their calendar of programs. Today we're happy to welcome Dr. Brian Rao of Radiation Oncology Associates as our guest physician today. Dr. Rao joined the healthcare system in 2012. He graduated from Wesleyan University, then went on to the University of Connecticut School of Medicine and completed his residency in radiation oncology at Yale New Haven Hospital. Upon finishing his training, he joined Radiation Oncology Association, Associates and has been one of the radiation oncologists here at Concord Hospital and the Payson Center for Cancer Care for the past 11 years. Please join me in welcoming Dr. Rao. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you so much. It's really an honor to be here, have this chance to talk to you guys today um, about something near and dear to my heart, which is uh, the use of radiation therapy to treat cancer. Um, this is the title of my talk. Uh, another, another title might be Radiation Oncology 101. Um, this is just, basically my hope is to just kind of demystify a little bit um, what happens in terms of uh, treating cancer with radiation, what, what a radiation oncology department is all about, what we do, a um, little bit of the history and a little bit of the what might be to come in the future. Um, but by all means, if you have um, questions as we go along, if there's something that is confusing you or not clear, please just raise your hand, let me know, because I'm, I'm not exactly sure how much familiarity everybody has with this topic. So if you, uh, if you have questions along the way, please feel free to interrupt me. Um, so as I said, my goals will be um, briefly talk about uh, the history of radiation oncology, which by no means am I, am I a, an expert historian in this regard, but it's, it's pretty interesting. Um, and, uh, and then we'll talk about what we do on a daily basis in the Department of Radiation Oncology, you know, how we use radiation, um, different issues that come up with it. Uh, we're going to touch on something that I call the radiation paradox, which is basically this idea of radiation both treating and potentially causing cancer, which is, um, you know, a, a confusing thing for a lot of people. I, I have a lot of patients that ask me about that um, when I first meet with them. And, um, you know, radiation and cancer have kind of gone hand in hand throughout the history that we've known about radiation. So we'll kind of we'll kind of explore why that is. Why would we use radiation to treat cancer, and also, you know, in a situation where radiation can cause cancer? Um, and then I thought it would just be interesting to review some cases. Um, you know, the first part of the lecture is more sort of theoretical, technical type stuff, um, and the, the second part with the cases is what I think is most easy to relate to and sort of. To me, the most interesting thing, you know, how does this come all come together in a patient? What does this look like when we create these treatments? Um, and so I'll have, you know, some examples of radiation plans and go over some things. There's a lot of acronyms in the field of radiation oncology um, that I'm trying to sort of not focus on too much, but kind of figure that as we go through the cases, we'll talk about some of those, those acronyms and those things that you might read about online um, to try to make them sort of more clear. Um, and then we'll just briefly touch on where we might be going forward. So um, this field basically um, basically started at the end of the 19th century, uh, and there was an explosion of scientific discovery around radiation. Um, people were, had these new technology, these things called Crookes tubes, which are uh, basically studying a stream of electrons going through a vacuum glass chamber. And the technology had gotten to the point where people were starting to sort of have the tools that would uncover what was going on with radiation. So this, uh, this uh, scientist, Wilhelm Rentgen, was using one of these Crookes tubes, and he had some uh, 
chemically coated screen that was a couple meters away, and he found that when he turned on the Crookes tube, the screen that was a couple meters away started glowing. And so he realized there's something happening in this tube that is transferring over to the chemically coated screen, and it, that is sort of what set off this eureka moment of something is happening within these tubes that's creating something that would have an effect, you know, a couple of meters away. So he kind of started studying that in more detail. The first x-ray of a human, I believe, that was taken was his wife. <laughs> and you can see her, the bones of her hand with her wedding, wedding ring on there. And, uh, and that, you know, things kind of took off from there. From there, people started exploring the use of diagnostic x-rays to, you know, look at bones and, and all sorts of things. But remarkably, um, within a couple months of these x-rays sort of being discovered and published, a couple, literally a couple months later, they were already used on a patient who had a breast cancer that kept recurring. And this, apparently at this time, uh, he was in, this, this gentleman, Emil Grub, was in medical training in Chicago. Apparently at that time, you could run an electric light bulb company while you were in medical school. That, that is not the case when I was in med school. I don't think any of my classes, classmates had electric companies, but <laughs> he apparently had a side company that was also using these Crookes tubes. And you know, the, the publication came out that there was something generated by these tubes and um, uh, Rentgen had, had termed it X-rays, X meaning sort of unknown quantity. Um, so they became known as X-rays and he, um, he noticed that he, in handling these tubes, he you know, was getting symptoms in his hands, they were getting itchy and swollen, and he was, talked to one of his professors at Hahnemann Medical College in Pennsylvania, and they thought, okay, if this is causing some impact on your hands handling this, what if we held these tubes close to a cancer, and could that have an effect on a, on a tumor? So in January 1896, a couple months after the, the publication, um, the first patient was treated with, uh, with radiation. Um, and so, you know, these cancer and radiation is sort of, they've been developing together for the past over a century. Um, around the same time, a year or two later, sort of a, a different type of radiation was discovered, but very similar. So um, Henri Becquerel discovered that certain um, that uranium, uh, a naturally occurring element, basically had a similar effect as those Crookes tubes, that he, he was doing experiments with these uranium crystals and he thought that the sun was a, you know, able to give energy to these crystals, which could then uh, you know, cause an effect. Um, and so he, one night he, he wrapped these um, photographic plates in black paper, he put the uranium crystals on top of it, he put it in a drawer to get, you know, put away to, used to study the next day. And when he opened up the drawer, he realized that the change had happened on the, on the plates through the black paper without the sun involved at all. And he realized whatever is happening, this is coming from the crystals, not from the sun. And it's actually fascinating because what he was discovering there is called gamma radiation, which is radiation produced by a naturally occurring element sort of that has an unstable nucleus that's changing energy states and it's releasing energy as it changes states. The physical properties of gamma rays are basically the same as X-rays, but they're produced in a different way. So within two or three years, these same phenomenon were discovered. Um, and this, this has become important throughout the history of radiation in a different way. The machines that we use now generally use X-rays, but um, this sort of naturally occurring radiation from an element can be used in certain situations that I'll touch on briefly a little bit later as well. Um, so he, so similarly, he, he discovered, you know, the, the, um, you know, the, the blob there is the original um, shadow of the uranium crystals, and then this is a, a Maltese cross that was sort of put between the crystals and the photographic plates, and so it was discovered that, you know, the, the, the material between the crystals and the plate was blocking the radiation, so you're sort of seeing a, a shadow of, in the shape of the cross there. So this was in the original paper that he published. And then um, Marie Curie, which a lot of us, many of us have heard of, um, she discovered two additional radioactive elements, polonium and radium, and did a lot of work over the decades of her career. I did want to mention, so her name I put up here, uh, Marie Skłodowska 
Curie. I put that in partially uh, out of respect to my wife and her family because her parents are from Poland. And uh, you hear about Madame Curie, and you know, I thought she was French, and I'm sure probably all of you did. And, uh, and she was actually Polish, and she uh, you know, moved to France because there were more opportunities to study science and then became known as Madame Curie. So I just kind of wanted to point out that it's actually Marie Skłodowska Curie. <laughs> um, so then things were really starting to, to get going from there. Um, in France, they were the first ones that started to give radiation the way we typically give it now, which is in small doses daily, um, in, you know, in small amounts sort of incrementally given day by day. So they started doing that in the early 1900s in France. These treatments were very limited because these were pretty low energy x-rays. So they really could only be used to treat skin cancers or you know, a, a cancer that was starting to sort of grow out of the body. Um, so it was pretty limited how they could use them at that point, but it was a start. And then um, you know, for the next couple of decades, there were tons of people just studying these things and working on creating higher energy x-rays, understanding you know, and measuring dose, understanding what happens if you break up radiation in small amounts, uh, understanding the side effects of radiation that patients were getting, um, dealing with some of the radiation safety issues, and, um, and then accurately measuring the dose of radiation with these ionization chambers. Um, as we get to the 1930s through 1950s, this is known as the orthovoltage era. So these were sort of higher energy machines than had been used before um, and starting to be able to treat a little bit deeper into the body. Um, by the 1950s and beyond, you were starting to get more powerful, uh, what we call the mega voltage area era. So now we're getting to energies of x-rays that can really penetrate more deeply in the body. Um, and there's this interesting effect called the skin sparing effect, where um, if you actually have a, higher, a high enough energy x-ray, the maximum dose of that is not right at the skin surface. It actually takes you know, a centimeter or two within the body for the dose to sort of build up. So, so it was kind of twofold. The, the higher energy x-rays are able to penetrate deeper because they are not losing their energy as quickly as they travel through the body, but also they are not affecting the skin as much. They're, they're kind of sparing the dose from the skin because that is what limited the dose that could be given on those orthovoltage treatments. The skin would start to get so red and irritated that you just, patients couldn't tolerate giving more. But if you get the skin sparing effect, you can give a higher dose deeper in the body than you ever could give before and the skin you know, was getting less dose and able to tolerate it. So that was, that was a huge development. Um, these are a couple of the early machines that were used. I think the one on the left is, I think that was the one in London where they would kind of bring it right close to the body to deliver the treatment. The one on the right was the first linear accelerator at Stanford in California. And um, you know, <laughs> it's this huge machine um, that basically the patient was rotated around. You can see he's kind of sitting on like a, a chair on a, on a circular device there and it was actually the machine stayed in place and the patient was rotated to try to treat from different angles and things like that. Um, and then as we get into the 1970s and beyond, then we start to get you know, closer to the machines that we use now uh, where you know, they're more reproducible treatments, they're more reliable, um, they're capable of producing very high energy x-rays that they never had dreamed of you know, in the early days. And importantly, they have these gantries, which I'll show you a picture of in a minute, where it's like the arm of the treatment machine rotates all the way around the patient. So the patient's on the table, the machine rotates all the way around, and it's called an isocentric machine, where it's basically always focused on a single point. And um, it's aiming x-rays from all different angles, kind of all focused on a single point. So it allowed for a much more advanced kind of treatment planning, um, and then, you know, more recently in the last couple of decades, um, it's hard for me to even imagine everything that I've talked about so far is purely historical to me. By the time I was in training, CAT scans, MRIs, PET scans were all, you know, completely routine. Everything we did was based on that. But that really has revolutionized treatment, both the imaging modalities where we can see inside people's bodies, we can see the tumor internally, we can use that to basically plan the radiation treatment. Um, is a completely different world. And, um, and then the computers that you know, allow us to create these plans that are so complex now, 
the plans that are created now, we couldn't create them without computers. It's, it's so complicated that um, you need the assistance of the software and you know, the, the information technology that goes along with those huge amounts of data that's involved in sort of creating these plans and transferring all of that information to the machines. It's, it's very complex, but it's, uh, it's pretty amazing. So um, now we get to sort of where we are now. Um, this mach the, the machine, the picture of the machine you're seeing there is actually a picture that I took from our department downstairs. Um, this is a very true beam machine that, we have, that we've had for a few years, which is awesome. It has all the bells and whistles. Um, basically, you know, you see uh, this is the treatment table where the patients lie down. Um, this is what we call the gantry or the head of the machine where the x-rays come out of. Uh, this kind of rotates all the way around the table from every different angle. You've also got the, basically on these machines built in, you've got these CAT scans that we can do f with the treatment machine. So we can, when the patient's lying on the table, we can do a quick CAT scan, get a picture of exactly where things are located in that moment, and make, you know, millimeter adjustments as needed. Um, so, um, and then we've got, you know, in, within the room, there are these lasers on the walls that sort of help line, line up to the patient. A lot of times you've probably heard of radiation tattoos. Um, a lot of times during the planning process, people get little dots on their skin that are kind of aligned to the lasers that are in the room to sort of get them in the right position before we ever, ever start. Um, and then this is a quick schematic of sort of how the radiation is generated. This is a little bit of physics. It's probably more information than you want. But um, you know, basically, there's these electrons that are created by heating uh, tungsten or other metals, and then they're accelerated close to the speed of light in this accelerating waveguide. And those electron beams that are you know, going almost, this, oops, almost the speed of light go through in, into the head of the machine, into the gantry that I showed you before. And they go, and then they kind of rotate around, and then they are aimed down towards the patient. And the beam is sort of shaped and changed as it goes through the head of the machine. Um, so that's kind of a, skip, a quick schematic of how a, a linear accelerator works. Um, this is a kind of a close-up picture of if you were to look just at the head of the gantry, uh, the head of the machine, sort of the last part of the machine before the radiation comes out. These are little uh, what we call multi-leaf collimators. So this is, these machines have up to like 120 individually motorized uh, tungsten blocks that kind of can very uh, finely shape the x-rays that are coming out of the machine. And with our more complex treatments now, we actually have these multi-leaf coll collimator leaves kind of moving in and out of the treatment the entire time the machine is on and really sort of finely shaping the dose that's going in there. Um, so again, so some of this, I know this is a little bit um, esoteric, but some of it will get a little more clear once we start looking at some plans. Um, so changing gear a little bit, um, I wanted to just give a quick shout out to these two people here on the bottom of the screen. I don't know how many of you know them, but <laughs> uh, Tom Sheldon and Tammy Newell um, basically were the f two of the first people to, to start radiation oncology at Concord Hospital. Tom is one of my partners in radiation oncology associates. He had been at the Elliott Hospital and about in uh, 2003, uh, Concord opened up their own department here. So he moved up here and he's been basically the you know, full-time Concord radiation oncologist since that time. Tammy Newell had worked with him for a couple decades before, I think in Boston they worked together and she sort of followed him up and she's, she was the, the lead therapist up until very recently. She just retired a few months ago. But they've been instrumental to the development of the cancer program here at Concord, um, which is a really, in my opinion, a really incredible program. Um, you know, I put a map of New Hampshire there, um, basically to, to point out partly that Concord really plays an important role in, in providing cancer care for patients in New Hampshire because you basically have, over here you have Lebanon, uh, so the Dartmouth you know, Radiation Oncology Department is here. Uh, you've got Concord, you've got uh, Wentworth Douglas Hospital in Dover, and then you've got some sites in Maine. But there's this whole area, you know, the Lakes region and the White Mountain area um, that basically all, all, you know, can go down 93 straight to Concord. And we end up providing a treatment for a huge geographic area. And 
you know, really high level treatment too. You know, it's, you know, Cochrane is not a tertiary center per se, but there's very few treatments that we can't do at Concord that we would have to send someone to other places. And um, it's a really great department. Um, uh, just to go through some of the history there, um, opened in 2003, they had one machine at that time. Uh, second machine was added in 2005. And then these are some of those confusing acronyms that I alluded to before. Um, so CBCT stands for cone beam CT, which is what I pointed out on that picture before. Um, basically a, a CAT scan attached to the machine that allows us to give very accurate treatment. So that was kind of added to one of the machines in 2014. Um, that newer machine that I showed you the picture of was 2016. Um, and, and shortly after that was installed, we started doing something called SBRT, which it stands for, it, it's not terribly important, but it stands for Stereotactic Body Radiation Therapy. And basically the idea with that is that instead of these small daily doses given over you know 30 35 treatments things like that sbrt uses very powerful doses of radiation just given in like three to five fractions so it's particularly important for things like lung cancer where um, you know patients that used to have to come for six weeks can now get three to five treatments and the treatments are better they are more effective you know cause less side effects and it's done in a week instead of you know six or seven so that's been a huge development in, in the field in general and also here at Concord. Um, SRS uh, stands for Stereotactic Radio Surgery, which is basically a similar idea, but that, that applies to cancers that are in the brain. Um, so SRS technically refers to like a single fraction of very powerful radiation accurately aimed at a tumor in the brain that you know, tends to be very effective, tends to cause very minimal side effects and has been a real um, game changer for patients that have cancer that spread to the brain in, in certain situations. Um, this last thing, a gated SBRT, I have a case that'll explain that better, but basically that gated refers to um, as the patient is breathing, the treatment is actually only being given during certain phases of the respiratory cycle. So as you breathe, things are gonna move up and down, and if it's moving a lot, um, that could cause us to have to treat a really big part of the lung. Um, and so if it's moving a lot, we can actually do treatments where we only treat it when it's, say, like in the upper half of its, of its uh, course going up and down, and it kinda gives the same treatment but spares normal tissue that we're treating. Um, so it tends to be better tolerated. So um, just sort of a quick, big picture view of, um, of cancer treatment in 2023. Um, obviously I'm talking about, you know, Western medicine, more conventional treatments here, but within um, Western medicine, there's basically three main ways that we treat cancer. Surgery, which everyone's pretty familiar with. It's pretty intuitive what surgery is. You're basically just removing the cancer physically from the body. Um, medicines, which could refer to chemotherapy, or there's newer medicines called immunotherapy, which are given to kind of ramp up the body's immune system to fight cancer. There's all sorts of targeted therapies that the medical oncologists give that, um, you know, might cause fewer side effects than chemo that are more specific, you know, maybe targeting a specific part of a cell that only the cancer cells have. Um, so, but those kind of, all those treatments sort of fall under medicines um, and those basically go into the bloodstream and travel everywhere so they you know treat the whole body um, and then radiation which is obviously what we're talking about and radiation i think is in some ways the the least intuitive of the three um, it's it's harder to visualize and people have you know potentially less experience with it and and potentially some kind of scary associations with it sometimes um, and we use all three of these modalities and it depends on what type of cancer it is, what stage of cancer it is. There's all sorts of different clinical scenarios where we might use just one of these treatments or a combination of a couple or all three. Um, and really each, each type of cancer and stage has its own, you know, kind of preferred uh, combinations of those three. Um, so we can do radiation in a lot of different ways. Um, Sometimes radiation is the primary treatment. Um, sometimes it's the only treatment. Um, you know, cases where we, where we do that sort of treatment, this is not an exhaustive list, this is just some examples, but 
Um, you know, lung cancer, early stage lung cancers, like I described, using that SBRT technique uh, is an extremely important option for patients now. In more advanced lung cancers that maybe have spread to lymph nodes, we might use a combination of chemotherapy and radiation. Um, head and neck cancers, so cancers that start in the tonsil or the base of the tongue, um, often we're treating with chemotherapy and radiation as the only treatment they get. Uh, skin cancers, anal cancers, those are all often treated with radiation alone or a combination of chemo and radiation. Um, some adjuvant treatment is basically giving radiation after another type of treatment. So like in the case of breast cancer, the surgery is, is basically the, the biggest part of the treatment and then radiation is given afterwards or the terminology is adjuvantly to try to clean up if there's any microscopic cells remaining after the surgery. Um, sometimes that's given in the reverse order where we give some treatments before surgery to try to shrink a tumor or try to, you know, allow the surgeons to um, get a complete resection, um, you know, make it more easily resectable and clean up any microscopic cells nearby. Um, so that's called neoadjuvant where we give it before the main treatment. So, the, you know, a couple examples of that are uh, esophageal and rectal cancer. We commonly do that. And then really a huge part of um, the practice of radiation oncology is when we're not necessarily trying to cure cancers, but we're trying to help with symptoms that they might be causing. Um, and that falls under palliative treatment. So um, radiation is often very helpful at reducing pain if cancer has spread to a bone. Um, so we treat a lot of patients that have, you know, stage four metastatic disease, but it's, you know, in, in a bone that's causing a lot of discomfort and we, you know, give them a few radiation treatments and a lot of times it really takes that pain away or greatly reduces it. Um, when cancer has spread to the brain, it can cause a lot of symptoms and so oftentimes radiation is used to try to control, you know, those tumors in the brain and keep those symptoms under control. And sometimes if patients are bleeding, you know, if they have a, something in their esophagus or their stomach that's bleeding and causing them to, you know, lose blood that way, we can actually stop the bleeding with some radiation treatments. So those are pretty common uh, treatments that we do in the palliative setting. Um, almost everything that we're talking about today falls under the realm of external beam radiation therapy. So that is the machine that I showed you that's basically using x-rays uh, that are aimed from outside the body to treat something in the body. But there is a whole other realm of radiation that I just am not going into too much because it it's, uh, it's deserves its own, ta own talk on its own, but something called brachytherapy, which is using those radioactive elements and actually physically implanting them internally in the body to give radiation right to that area. So. It's super important for um, gynecologic cancers, so like cervical cancer, um, extremely important. To, you know, almost always part of a curative treatment course for cervical cancer is basically having radiation sources implanted internally and giving, because it can give a really high dose of radiation right to that area without causing side effects elsewhere. Um, Dr. Sheldon has done hundreds of uh, prostate brachytherapy treatments where um, you know, radioactive iodine seeds are placed within the prostate and the radiation is delivered locally in that way. Um, so it is, a, it is an important modality, but I didn't want to make the talk too long, and so we're kind of glossing over that a bit. And then there's some treatments that, where there's radioactive elements that are attached to drugs, um, medications, that it, where it can kind of deliver radiation locally in that way, like for example, um, sometimes thi after thyroid cancer, radioactive iodine is given in the bloodstream that might, you know, get rid of any, any cancer cells in the, in the thyroid area. Um, so this is sort of what I mentioned at the beginning there, um, the radiation paradox. So I would say maybe half the times I, I meet with someone for the first time, people in some form or another kind of ask, you know, or, or they're just, they're feeling a little nervous because they're been told they need radiation, but everything they've heard, uh, heard up until this point in their life was that you should avoid radiation because radiation can be harmful and radiation can cause cancer, which is true. Um, and we'll talk about kind of why that is in a second, but um, the way that I kind of think about this question is oftentimes when we hear about these things like, um, 
you know, going through an x-ray machine at an airport or, um, you know, some sort or cell phones or some sort of exposure to radiation that you're getting in everyday life. And, you know, there's articles about how dangerous it is, how harmful it is. A lot of times what that's looking at is populations of people who are being exposed to these small amounts of radiation and maybe, you know, maybe one in a hundred thousand or something will get a cancer because they, you know, that radiation impacted and caused a mutation to happen that led to a cancer. So it's, it's often talking about very small chance of it happening, but it is important on a population level. You know, if, if millions of people are passing through airports, this is just an example, I'm not saying you shouldn't fly or anything, uh, but, um, you know, for, for example, if millions of people are doing it, even if it's a, a low rate that it would happen for any one person, it still might be important on a population level. But when someone who is being referred to us, they have been diagnosed with a cancer. So that's a totally different situation where once that happens, that is the most important, that is the most threatening thing to that person, getting rid of that cancer that has been diagnosed. And so, there, you know, there might be a, a one in a thousand, one in 10,000 chance that a radiation treatment would cause a cancer. But if we don't do the treatment, there might be, you know, a 50% chance that that cancer comes back and causes a real problem for that person. So it's, it kind of, it's a change in perspective of you know, a population level risk of radiation exposure versus once someone ha has a risk that has been identified, getting rid of that risky cancer becomes the most important thing to, to keeping them healthy. Um, and so the reason for that, which I alluded to, is basically that the reason both of those things can happen is that radiation can cause changes to DNA. So in the context of, you know, cancer, uh, cancer uh, radiation causing a cancer, that radiation has either directly or indirectly injured the DNA. Maybe, maybe the cell continues to live, but it has a mutation so that certain functions are not working properly. And so certain mutations are, will predispose the cell to dividing uncontrollably, and that's what can lead to a cancer. And, and oftentimes it's, you know, it's, of, it's often multiple different mutations over time that, that lead to a situation where someone develops a cancer but that's what's happening in that situation. In the, in the treatment of cancer, we're intentionally causing injury to the DNA of the cancer cells so that we basically kill them in that way, that the, the cancer cells can't deal with that injury and they die off. So um, this is just a little schematic drawing. Um, it shows you, you know, the top line is basically, there's a normal cell and then two different cancer cells. It's showing you that the normal cell has multiple different ways of repairing DNA damage, whereas the cancer cells are not functioning properly. They might only have one, one way to correct that injury. So, you know, in, in the first situation, the blue one, uh, the normal cell, you know, gets exposed to radiation, there's an injury, and it's got the tools it needs to repair it, and th that cell survives. In the second one, the yellow, the yellow sequence there, the cancer cell gets injured, it is able to repair um, the damage. The third line, the, the red sequence there, the cancer cell is damaged, but it doesn't have the tools that it needs to repair it, and it then dies. So obviously this is kind of oversimplifying things, but that's kind of the general idea that the reason we use radiation to treat cancer cells, and we're able to do that without causing too much injury to the normal cells, is that your normal tissue, your normal cells are better able to repair that damage. So the cancer cells are sort of faulty and they're less, they're more susceptible to the injury of that radiation. So if we give, you know, usually little bits each day over the course of radiation, the cancer cells will all be killed by that. And the normal cells, you know, they might have some side effects, but hopefully overall it's pretty minimal and, and well tolerated. So if there was one slide to explain sort of how I conceptualize what we do in radiation oncology, um, it's this one. It's basically, you know, radiation oncology is all about trying to cause injury to the cancer cells, to, to tumors, while minimizing injury to normal tissue. I mean, that, that's basically kind of summarizes the vast majority of the work that I do. Um, just, we're trying to get rid of the cancer cells, we're trying to cause as minimal impact for patients as possible. There's multiple different ways to go about doing that. 
one of which is, is what I said just recently, you know, fractionation, meaning breaking up the radiation into small amounts. We, can, we could kill any, any cancer if we give it a high enough dose of radiation, we, you know, even the hardest ones. We could kill pancreatic cancer if we gave it a high enough dose of radiation. But the problem is that you give, you know, that high a dose of radiation, particularly in like one treatment, you're going to cause all sorts of side effects and it wouldn't end up being a, actually a good thing for the patient. So the idea with the fractionation is that we amplify this difference between the cancer cells and the normal cells and their ability to handle the damage. And we do that over time and hopefully we kill the cancer cells and cause minimal effects for the patient. Um, you know, you can vary the dose per treatment. So that's kind of, as we discussed with the SBRT, the SBRT treatments are using very strong doses of radiation each day and we're able to do it because we're being very, very precise with the area that we treat. Um, and we're doing it in locations where there's not some critical structure right next to it. You know, we couldn't, we couldn't you know, give certain doses right next to the spinal cord or, or right next to certain nerves or different areas of the body because it would cause a side effect. So, um, you know, but it, potentially changing around how much radiation each day that you're giving can, can change that in your favor. Um, Minimizing the area that we're treating um, is a, an important way of uh, trying to minimize side effects. And that is a big part of the story of how things have changed over the past few decades. Um, you know, a lot of times we're not, a lot of times we're not necessarily giving higher doses, although sometimes we are. But a lot of times we're giving the same doses we gave 30 years ago, but causing a lot fewer problems because we're able to be much more precise with where that radiation is going and, um, and you know, what dose is going to the normal tissues. And then sometimes we give um, medicines to try to sort of enhance the effect of radiation. So a lot of times chemotherapy um, can uh, improve the, um, basically make the radiation more effective and stronger because it kind of makes the cancer cells more sensitive to the effects of the radiation and the combination is able to kill them off. Um, so just real quickly, um, when you go, you know, the radiation department, there's, it's certainly not just me. There's a whole team of people uh, that are doing these things. So, you know, the people in the front desk, they do the scheduling, they get all the records that we need. They um, do a lot of the behind the scenes works. The nurses and LNAs are critical in terms of just uh, evaluating patients, you know, taking their vital signs, making sure they're doing okay. Uh, the MDs, um, the radiation therapists are the team of, um, of people who bring the patients into the room. They get them set up in the treatment position. They actually are the ones that operate the machines. Um, you would not want me operating the machines. I wouldn't know which buttons to press, but they are specifically trained in, you know, how to do that part of it. Um, there's, uh, you know, once we sort of start designing a treatment plan, there's a team of people who are helping to create that plan on the computer, so dosimetry, um, there's, you know, three or four dosimetrists in Concord that kind of design these treatment plans for us to review. And um, the physics team, you know, checks the safety of the machines, makes sure the output is what we expect, a lot of behind the scenes support. Um, and then we've got a whole slew of great professionals here at the <coughs> Cancer Center that support people through this. So um, dietitian, nurse navigators, social work team, massage, Reiki, all sorts of additional support for people who are going through these treatments. So it's really really a, a team approach. The way, um, the way this typically goes in terms of a patient actually going through these treatments is it starts with a referral to us. You know, very few people just pick up the phone and decide they want to see a radiation oncologist that day. They're typically referred from a surgeon or a medical oncologist or, or someone else. Um, then we, we meet with them in consultation. We, you know, review all their records. We decide whether radiation is appropriate. We, we talk to the patients about the risks and benefits. We make a recommendation and if, you know, we agree that we're going to go ahead with it, then the next step is doing a, uh, what we call a simulation or a planning session. So where we kind of map out how the radiation is given. Um, so at that, at that visit, you know, we basically get the patient in the position they're going to be in for the treatment. We typically do a CAT scan, which gives us a picture of their body while they're in that treatment position. We sometimes give them a few little tattoo marks. Um, and we basically get everything set up and how we think we're going to do the treatment. Then the patient goes home and it usually takes, you know, a few days or a week or so for the team um, to sort of get the plans ready. 
Um, we're going to look at a few plans in a minute here. Um, and then once the treatments start, most commonly they're given five days a week. Uh, that might be, you know, uh, as, as sometimes just one week. For some situations, it might be up to nine weeks. It's usually somewhere in the middle there. Um, and then after the treatments are done, we, you know, we typically see people and follow up and see how they're doing and how they tolerated everything. Any questions so far before we jump into the cases? I have yeah. one question. Sure. Um, the beautiful machine that you showed us, how much does that cost? <laughs> That's a good question. Pam, how much does that cost? <laughs> Uh, um, another good question. <laughs> um, to be, uh, do you know? Do you know the answer? I'm not. Probably about four and a half million. Yeah, yeah. When you also consider the construction that's required, and is construction required even when you're replacing it because you're gonna get the old one out and put the new one in. So it's a really good reason to donate. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> How much did she pay you to say that? <laughs> <laughs> but, you know, they don't last forever. Right. 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 If, if you go outside, as you, as you see, and you'll see some construction happening near the, uh, near the entrance to the Payson Center. We're about to take number, or number two is already out of commission. Yeah. And so number two is out of commission while we're, while they're getting it out of there and preparing to put in what would now be number four. Yeah. So we've replaced the first one. Then we've, and then, and then we replaced, then we put in the second one, then we replaced the first one with the third one, and now we're replacing the second one with the fourth one. Yeah. Yeah. You know, it's, it's, um, you know some people, it's not, it's not actually the, what I would call the technology wars. These babies run out of steam. And I think yeah. that by the time we replaced the first one, it, it, it was on fire. We had to take it out of commission. Yeah. Fire. Right. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Yeah. I mean, we, we work them pretty hard. I mean, the, these machines are operating, you know, 10 hours a day, five days a week for years and years and years. And then also, you know, the technology evolves over that time. It's like getting a, it's like getting a car after you've been driving the same car for 15 years. You know, you get into a new one. It's like you can't believe all the, all the options that are on there. That's kind of how it is. Like, Everything I've talked about now, if you get a machine, it, all of this is on there. You know, the CAT, the CAT scans are on the machine. The ability to do all these complex treatments is already on there. It, you know, if you have technology that's 15, 20 years older, you might be trying to sort of tack it on, but it's not as smooth as, you know, something that was designed to be, to do that from the start, so. Um, other questions right now before we do some cases here? Um, so, um, so this is, so prostate cancer is a great example of, uh, of how treatment planning has evolved over time to become much more specific to, uh, to exactly where we're treating. So uh, this is just a, an example. So a 68 year old gentleman uh, gets some annual blood work. He's found to have a PSA that's too high. His PSA is eight. He's referred to a urologist. The urologist biopsies his prostate and finds Gleason 7 prostate cancer in three out of 12 biopsy cores. Um, he has some imaging that shows no evidence that anything has spread anywhere else. And he's basically, you know, talked to about the options of surgery or radiation. For whatever reason, he decides he would rather do radiation. So this is before I've been practicing radiation oncology. So this is how plans used to be done before CAT scans were routine. So basically plans would be designed based on bony anatomy. So x-rays would be done from a an anterior posterior direction and then a lateral direction and, P and the radiation oncologist would literally draw on the x-ray slide you know this is this is how we want to treat it this is where the beam is going to go um, you know uh, on this patient you can see on the bottom picture there's those little dots they've placed a catheter um, which you know basically allows you to see where the urethra runs the urethra runs through the through the prostate so okay, they're, they're following sort of where the catheter is there, but they can't actually see the prostate. They're just, they're seeing, they know where the prostate should be located. So when you have that amount of uncertainty about, you know, I think this is where it is, but I can't see it, you have to use a pretty big margin so you don't miss. So they're treating this whole region. Um, so that's kind of what a 2D plan would look like. These two things are examples of, so 3D is, um, much more complex than 2D. It's using a CAT scan. They have a CAT scan that, gives, that allows you to see where the prostate is. 
Um, but uh, they have to use kind of wider margins around where they're treating. So on, on, this, on this scan, this is like a slice through the person's pelvis. The red line is basically outlining the prostate. So this is the prostate. And then the red dose is what you're seeing here. Different colors are different. Uh, different colors represent different doses. So basically the full dose is like the red dose. So for here, you know, the prostate is here, but they had to use sort of extra margins in every direction so that they didn't miss. And um, so this whole area is getting full dose. With the 2D treatment, it was an even, even bigger area than that. With this one, this IMRT plan, which is sort of the, the latest and greatest that we do now, um, it's very tightly contoured just to the prostate. What you see right behind the prostate here is the rectum. So that is where a lot of the side effects of prostate cancer come from. Um, as you're giving a high dose to the prostate, part of the rectum is going to get treated. It used to be the entire rectum that got treated. So people used to have rectal bleeding very frequently after prostate cancer treatment. And the doses that they could give were much lower because they were causing all these side effects. But now, this is a more modern example of a prostate treatment. So on this view, this is like a side view. So um, this is the rectum here, and this is the prostate. And you can see, you know, it's tightly, the dose is tightly shaped to the prostate and really minimizing any dose that's going to the rectum. This is the bladder here. This is sort of a cross-sectional view, like the patient's cut up like a loaf of bread. And on this one, you really see how the, the dose is shaped to carve out the rectum there. Um, so that, you can only do that with IMRT. You can only get that sort of dose distribution that does that sort of inward bending of the curve. Um, if it was 3D, where they're just aiming x-rays from different angles, you get a box distribution. So IMRT is needed to sort of carve dose like that, which it just makes a huge difference for patients. So we can now give a higher dose of treatment. We might be able to give faster treatments, you know, six weeks instead of nine weeks, that sort of thing. Um, and people, you know, now the, ritz, the risk of having rectal bleeding is like, you know, one or two percent, whereas it used to be 20, 30 percent. So it's made a huge difference with prostate cancer. Um, this is just a, an example of a breast cancer case. A uh, 56-year-old woman felt a lump in her left breast. Um, she had a mammogram that showed something that corresponded to that. An ultrasound confirmed a two and a half centimeter mass. The lymph nodes looked normal on ultrasound. She had a biopsy that showed invasive ductal carcinoma, high grade, ERPR positive, HER2 new negative. Um, and she saw a surgeon, underwent a lumpectomy, which is removing just that part of the breast where the, where the tumor is, not a mastectomy where the entire breast is removed, but just a, a lumpectomy. Um, and they sampled a couple lymph nodes. Um, and at the time of the lymph node sampling, they actually found that two out of three lymph nodes were involved. So it didn't look like they were involved before the surgery. At the time of surgery, a couple lymph nodes were involved. Margins were negative. So um, that patient went on to get chemotherapy and then required radiation treatment to the left breast and the lymph nodes nearby. So <clears throat> what I wanted to point out with this one is that um, this is an example of sort of a planning CAT scan with just kind of regular breathing. You see, um, you know, this, this is the heart right here. So this is like a side view of the patient. This is the heart right here. This is the, the breast tissue. Um, this is using something called breath hold treatment, where we have the patient take a deep breath and hold it. Um, we do a CAT scan with them holding their breath, and then each day that they get the treatment, they hold their breath during the treatment. And what you can see here, it's not, it might not look super dramatic, but the heart here, if you compare it to this one, the, you see how you can see more lung there? Um, the, the heart is lower down, because when you take a deep breath, the diaphragm falls, and the heart sort of falls a little bit in the chest. And basically what it's doing is clearing up a little bit of space between the heart and where we need to treat. This, these little yellow, um, this yellow markers here, these are internal mammary lymph nodes. So um, these are lymph nodes that are at risk that should be treated that geometrically it can be challenging to treat those lymph nodes, the lymph nodes under the arm, the breast tissue, while avoiding the heart. Um, but with this technique, uh, we can really do that uh, to a great extent. So this is kind of three views. I apologize for the LB and the numbers on the screen. It kind of confuses it a little bit. But um, you know, the one on the left is a cross-sectional view. 
this is like a side view. And you can kind of see how the, the dose of radiation is sort of sculpted around the heart. So it's, you know, this is the heart right here, and this is the radiation dose missing the heart. So um, this is just one, you know, incremental benefit that is further pushing things in favor of minimizing side effects, getting the same benefit of the radiation, but not putting the patient at risk for having heart problems years down the road. Um, this, the next patient, um, head and neck cancers, radiation is super important for head and neck cancers. Um, it's uh, one of the hardest treatments we do. Patients come for seven weeks. A lot of times they get chemotherapy. They have a lot of side effects. It's a tough treatment, but um, the success rates when it's done properly are really often fantastic. And um, so it's like a tough treatment, but a big payoff. People can get cured from these cancers and, and live a good life, you know, for the rest of their life. Um, this, this example of 74 year old gentleman had some ear pain, pain with chewing, had a CAT scan that showed a mass at the back of his tongue with multiple lymph nodes in his neck that were enlarged. Uh, he saw an ENT doctor who saw a tumor at the base of his tongue. A biopsy was positive for squamous cell carcinoma, P16 positive, which means it is related to the HPV virus, um, which we're seeing often now. And the patient had a PET scan that showed intense uptake in the base of the tongue and the lymph nodes that looked a little too big. This is an example of a PET scan. Um, so you can see uh, the cross-sectional view on the left there. That's the tumor on the, it's the patient's left. I know it's the right of the screen, but patient's left, base of tongue. And then you see two different views there. The one on the right is a side view. This is, a, this is what the radiation plan looked like. So you can see that the, the red is the full dose. Um, and the blue and the blue is sort of a medium dose and the purple is a lower dose. So you can see the red is basically around where you saw that real bright areas on the PET scan. That's what's getting the full dose. The blue is sort of kind of a high risk area around the red. And then the purple or yeah, the purple is sort of lymph node areas that are at risk, but not, you know, at kind of at lower risk. So that's kind of what a plan looks like. This is an IMRT plan. It takes a lot of time to create. These are the parotid glands right here, and you can kind of see the dose is sort of sculpt, sculpted away from the parotid glands. People used to, when they used to give treatments, just an x-ray from each side, the parotid glands would get blasted with radiation and people would have, you know, bone dry mouths after a treatment, you know, no saliva at all. It causes a lot of problems in the future. So we, we can't fully spare it now, but we can greatly reduce how much dry mouth people have after these treatments now. And this is what the PET scan looked like after the treatment. So he's completely resolved. He's been cancer free. He's doing awesome. I mean, th this is what is the most rewarding thing about, about doing this work. You know, you, you see a PET scan like that before treatment and then you put him through a tough time, but we get him through it and then it looks like this. It's like the most gratifying thing that, that we do. Um, this one, sorry, I'm going a little fast here. I, I guess I didn't time this quite right, but uh, <laughs> uh, this is a lung case. Um, what I just wanted to point out with this, this is an example of the SBRT uh, treatments that we do. So the, the, the lung cancer on this one is this, this tiny little dot. It's pretty, it's pretty small, but when we do the mapping session, when we do the planning session, we do a special scan that allows us to see how it moves up and down as people breathe. And Basically, the tumor was moving that whole green, um, it was moving along that path. So it was moving, that, that was at the, you know, at its peak of the respiratory cycle and that was at the bottom. So if we were to treat that whole area, the whole path of where it moved, plus a little margin, we would end up treating a, a pretty good amount of lung for a pretty small tumor. And, you know, a lot of times people who have these, a lot of times they have a smoking history, they have COPD, they don't have a lot of extra lung tissue to spare. So. This was actually the first patient that we treated here with this gated SBRT. And so, um, you know, basically the treatment area that we treated was only part of that green path, but it was sort of the beam would turn on when the tumor was in that location. So it just kind of allowed us to treat a relatively small area compared to if we had treated this plus a margin around it, it would have been a lot more lung tissue and probably that patient would have had more difficulty breathing after the treatment. And the last one is an example of someone who had uh, lung cancer that spread to their brain. Um, 
found to have two pretty small brain metastases. Um, sometimes we do something called whole brain radiation if people have you know, many, many metastases in the brain. But more recently, if people have a limited number, one or two or three particularly, um, you know, so this is, this is the first metastasis here. And then the second one was this tiny little dot in the cerebellum down here. And so this was a stereotactic radiosurgery treatment where they got this very targeted treatment just to those two spots. With whole brain radiation, the entire brain would be treated. People get really tired. They can have more memory problems afterwards. Um, but with this, you're really focusing the dose, single, single treatment, just to a tiny little area, minimal side effects. And this is basically his MRI afterwards went from that down to just basically barely there. You know, that's probably dead. It's probably not still a cancer that's living there. Um, and the, uh, the tiny one is, you know, barely visible now. So, you know, this treatment is not likely to be completely curable, but this patient's been doing well for a year and a half. He's on systemic therapy, which is keeping it under control in other parts of his body, and he didn't have a lot of side effects from his brain radiation. So um, these are just, you know, some of the examples of what can be achieved with the technology that we have. And I apologize for going a full hour. I <laughs> meant to leave more time for questions, but um, I'm happy to answer any questions you guys have. Why, did you, why, did, why is that called radial surgery? It's, it's just, like it's just that's partly why I didn't go into the, te the terminology too much, because it, it's just how it evolved. The per first people who did it called it radio surgery, and then you sort of have these iterations of acronyms that are just kind of confusing. So <laughs> I don't really have a great answer for it. Uh, actually, sorry, I had one more slide. Um, I don't know. I can't see the future. I think it was going to happen. But, um, you know, I think w there will be continued improvements in just allowing for more accurate treatments and sort of treating less normal tissue, uh, altering the fractionation, doing those, you know, SBRT for different types of tumors in different locations, um, newer targeted treatments that might help us um, kill cancer cells with fewer side effects. And then, you know, I don't I, like, like the, how the talk started with these people who discovered x-rays. I mean, things happen in science where it's a total, total game changer, total, everything shifts and you don't, you don't know that it's going to happen until it happens. But if it is, uh, if I had to predict, I would say one of, yeah. one of these two guys might be the one who discovers it. These are my, <laughs> my beautiful sons and my beautiful wife there. <laughs> and um, this is, this is the team, um, these, this is a lot of the team downstairs. This was Tammy Newell's retirement party uh, a few months ago. And so this is a lot of the therapists and dosimetrists and nurses and everyone that I work with that uh, I'm so, so grateful to work with. There's such an incredible team here. It's really a unique uh, collection of individuals that I can't tell you how many patients at the end of treatment say, you know, I'm glad the treatment's over, but I'm actually gonna miss, you know, seeing, seeing these people because they make, they make it really, they care about the patients, they really make them feel comfortable, and they, they re really are dedicated to what they do. So that's it. Very good. Very good. Thank you very much. Yeah, and sure. I think you'll all agree that that was incredibly interesting. It really, really was. And we thank you for joining us today on behalf of the entire staff of the Trust. Thank you for presenting. Please enjoy your weekend. Next month, we will rejoin here Friday, June 10th, and Dr. William McCann from Affiliates and Podiatry will be our presenter. So thanks again. Yeah, Have sure. My pleasure. Day. Thank you. Thank you.